hello and welcome to this week's episode of Political State from the Oklahoman. I'm Ben Felder here in the Oklahoman's downtown video studio. Joining me this week, my colleagues Justin Wingeter and Darla Slipke. Um, we are going to be getting into Governor Mary Fallon's legacy as we uh, all attention is on Governor-elect Kevin Stitt as he prepares to take office on January 14th. But as the, it is the end of two terms for Governor Mary Fallon. Our colleague, Dale Denwalt, who's not able to join us today, actually has a story this Sunday taking a closer look at Fallon's legacy. He sat down with uh, Governor Fallon this week uh, to discuss that with her. And before we get into our conversation, we're going to open up with a clip from that interview in which Dale asked Governor Fallon, 20 years from now, what does she hope her legacy as governor and as a person is? Well, I, hope, I, I hope I'll have been a, a fun grandmother and, and a great wife. and. For the state of Oklahoma, I, I hope that what people say is, you know, she left it in a much better place than where it was, and we have done that. I mean, there's certainly always bumps in the roads, uh, big issues that are very challenging. You're never going to make everybody happy, but if you really want to change things, you got to make some tough decisions and be willing to fade the heat to get those things done. And, and I'm very proud that once again we took the economy through two downturns. One when I came in, one they hit in 2014, to bring it right back out. Uh, most governors don't have two economic downturns in a, ter in a term, but it, it was just the way it was, and glad to leave it in a better shape. And it seems like so Governor Fallon, she leaves office. You know, she was the state's first governor, the 27th governor of the state, and the first female governor. Um, you know, she refers to the fact leaving the state in a better place, and we'll unpack that here in a little bit. But I think that's, you know, in a lot of ways true, especially when you look at some of the economic downturns, uh, two of which that were under her watch. Um, but, you know, she also leaves pretty bruised. I mean, low approval ratings. She was uh, the punching bag for both candidates running for governor, Democrat and Republican. Yeah. Um, Justin, what is her legacy when we look back at uh, Governor Fallon? Yeah, I, I look at a, a governor who had some accomplishments and did a really poor job of talking about them. I think uh, her achievements were overshadowed by her criticism or her critics' criticisms of her. I think she allowed her critics to paint her in certain ways uh, when she did not speak publicly about a lot of things. Uh, areas like criminal justice reform where she has had major accomplishments uh, have somewhat been overshadowed by the budget and they've also just, she's just never been able to really grab hold of that and show people what she has done. There have been achievements. I don't want to uh, get away from that. I mean, there have been certainly accomplishments. I just don't think she's done a great job of selling them to the people of Oklahoma. Yeah, she's not, she hasn't been the best kind of communicator in chief, so to speak. I mean, yeah. she obviously has some, you know, effective political skills. I mean, she's run for very, for numerous office, legislature, Congress, governor, she's never lost. Never lost. So she's obviously talented in that regard. Um, but she's never kind of come across during those times as kind of the iron fist, so to speak, uh, during, you know, these challenges of the budget. I mean, most recently, you know, she vetoed a budget. I mean, so she did have some power and she flexed her political muscle to bring the legislature back to have them get done what she wanted to get done um, but yeah it was not the most forceful communicator which sometimes you know you look to a governor for you mentioned criminal justice reform and Darla it's one of the reasons we wanted to have you join us this week is that's um, it's going to be a part of her legacy you know especially as of late uh, this week uh, you know she's uh, you know commuting the sentences of, of dozens of, of people behind bars. Oklahomans have reduced uh, sentencing um, for low-level low level drug crimes and now she's playing a part in kind of retroactively bringing those uh, implications to those. First off, just tell us what happened this week uh, with this, the, these commutation process. Yes, yeah, so Wednesday morning the governor actually signed off on 21 commutations for nonviolent offenders who are all, who were all serving 10 years or more in prison for crimes that um, had they been committed today, they would be facing either no prison time or significantly uh, less uh, time. And so it was it was a very emotional day. Um, the governor announced that signing off on each case individually at the state capitol. Um, there were dozens of family and friends who had gathered hope, hoping for the good news that they ended up getting that day. but. Um, 
It was a very emotional day at the Capitol for that ceremony. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know during her watch, uh, not, not to blame her for this, but I mean, Oklahoma has led the nation in female incarceration. Uh, just this last year, overall incarceration took the number one spot. Um, but this is what, an example of some of the power that the governor has, I mean, be, to be able to free um, inmates. And especially the last couple of years, she's talked quite a bit about criminal justice reform. And, I, I, you know, Darla, talk to us about this moment and what she's doing and then, you know, hoping to, like, build momentum going forward because even though she won't be in office next year, there's already talk uh, between some lawmakers, many lawmakers, of a bipartisan effort to kind of continue this effort, right? Yes, that's right. There does appear to be um, a push that may come in the upcoming legislative session to try to make state question 780 uh, retroactive, which voters approved in 2016 and um, makes simple drug possession a, a misdemeanor instead of a felony. And several lawmakers have already spoken out um, saying that they intend to file legislation and push for that in the upcoming session so that there does appear to be some momentum toward that. Yeah, and so this action this week uh, by the governor kind of carries on that momentum. I also wonder if it kind of, you know, gives an example to the next governor, Governor Lex Ditt. Not to say that he was, he's on the fence about these issues. He's talked some about, you know, you know wanting to reduce uh, Oklahoma's uh, incarceration rate, but by her doing that, it kind of propels us into the next year. And I wonder, it, you know, Governor Alex Stitt has a little bit of cover to continue on that. Do you think? I think so. And I think what Governor Fallon has done in changing the conversation should not be downplayed. This is a very difficult conversation to change people's minds on. Yeah. It was tough on crime, throw away, or you lock them up, throw away the key for decades and decades. Especially and, in a state like Oklahoma. Absolutely. And she has not been able to change course the way Texas did. I mean, a complete 180 down in Texas. Uh, however, she has made some progress. And any progress on this front is remarkable because it is just very difficult to change the minds, the established mindset of a state, of a, especially of a, uh, a Republican Party, for that had been so ingrained for decades of always being tough on crime and now it's smart on crime, and that, that just should not be downplayed. That is a, a remarkable ability to even change the conversation a little bit, which she has done. And now you have uh, both candidates, I think, ran for governor um, on the idea that, yeah, you have to continue this progress, maybe even make some uh, you know, more drastic changes on this front. But everyone recognizes now that the state locks up too many people and that progress can be made and conservative progress can be made. Uh, from Republicans on this issue. Yeah, and if you're a critic of Fallon, it's easy to say like, well, I mean, we were already headed in that direction. I'm not sure how much credit she gets. But the last several, I remember several State of the State addresses ago, I mean, she referenced this at a time when that wasn't necessarily, you know, politically the most, um, you know, advised thing for a Republican candidate, um, you know, seeking re-election. I mean, she has talked about this. She has used her bully pulpit, and we've talked about, you know, whether or not she's a, an effective communicator, but one way or another, she has used her bully pulpit um, you know, to talk about criminal justice reform. And, you know, Darla, I'm thinking about this week is, is so monumental because, you know, I was talking to some people in the, you know, prison industry or criminal justice reform industry this week who were saying that that image of her of her signing those commutations, you know, those women being released, that's what really impacts, um, you know, the hearts and minds of Oklahomans. So give us a little bit of a, of a of a peek of what that experience was like for this this ceremony, which was more than just a simple ceremony of signing some paperwork. Right. So, uh, Governor Fallon went through and reviewed each each case one by one, signing the paperwork, and there were just lots of tears that day, um, lots of applause, cheers, high fives, uh, fist bumps, um, family families and friends of of these offenders um, who had traveled across the state to be there hoping hoping for this good news um, who found out that their loved ones would be released that day because mm -hmm. their sentences were commuted to time served um, and something that Governor Fallon talked about and also um, leaders of a campaign that had been assisting mm -hmm. these individuals who applied for commutation was the fact that most most of the individuals, I think all but one, um, were women, and many of them were, were mothers. So the impact that this will have uh, for families in the state will also be uh, big. Yeah. What, I mean, how, you know, I'm asking you to kind of look in the future here a little bit, but do you, I mean, how much of a momentum do you feel like there is for next session uh, for continuing these efforts? I mean, we, you know, we see, we've seen a Republican and a Democrat say, hey, we want to support legislation, but do you get the sense that there really is a lot of momentum, that this is going to be something that we see talked quite a bit about in the next legislative session? It, 
it seems that it, it likely will be, um, I think, because of the bipartisan support that there seems to be. There's There's been talk of this in the past and some, some pushes, but I think um, the support you're seeing from the lawmakers who are speaking out that they're, they're planning to make this a priority and also um, Oklahomans for Criminal Justice Reform, which pushed for State Question 780 and has been leading this commutation campaign, is, is hoping to kind of build on the momentum from that campaign. So they're in talks with lawmakers as well and really, really advocating for that. Um, so there does seem to be a lot of attention that could, could carry over and could, could translate into some action this, this yeah. session. And of course, we don't have the, the budget emergencies we sometimes yeah. do. We've talked to legislators on the show that this could be a more proactive session because you're not reacting to the contrary of you know, the scandal or the, the, the crisis of the moment. You can actually start to look ahead on, on something like criminal justice reform, and it could be a good session for that. Yeah, and I think about just this week. I mean, this may be, you know, it sounds silly to say almost, you know, at, you know one of the last weeks that she has an office. This may be one of the best weeks for her. You know, it, you know, it took eight years, but here she is having, you know, a week where she's probably getting some of her best uh, attention from people, and I also just wonder if you know Governor Elect Kevin Stead is not going to. That's not going to go unnoticed. He's probably thinking like, I want to do that. <laughs> you know, I want to. I want to be on that stage, signing those kind of uh, commutations and having that kind of response as well. Um, and I also wonder if this is just a product of what we've talked about this shift towards more moderation, especially in the Republican Party. I mean, more moderate members are probably going to be a lot more open uh, to criminal justice reform. And these sort of ceremonies are just more kind of getting back to my point of. The governor had real achievements and did, she did, often did not celebrate and talk about in a way that I thought were really effective and really brought people in. Where, I mean, you, if you watch that uh, ceremony the other day that, that Darla was talking about, I mean, that, that's going to bring some people in. Some people who may not have known about this issue, maybe even didn't care about this issue, mm -hmm. see that. You see the emotional effect on people and you start to really think about this issue in a way that you didn't previously or when it's just numbers on paper it's a little harder to to really grasp but, but when you see something like that I, I, I thought she could have been a little more effective in her tenure and, and really bringing people in an emotional way to her side to her policies which I don't think were terribly unpopular not certainly not as unpopular as she is so why are why is she less popular than I think her policies well I that to me is communication I, I just think she didn't uh, a, you know, a less than ideal job of, of communicating sometimes. Yeah. Well, and, and some people say like, well, hey, why are we giving her so much credit? There, you know, how how involved was she? But you know, that's 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 what you get as governor. You get credit when things are going good. You get blamed when things are going bad. Yeah. We saw a lot of things go bad uh, during oh, your yeah. watch. So if she's going to get the credit. She's also going to get the blame. Right. And many Oklahomans seem to assign the blame to her when you look at her her low approval ratings. I mean, she had to deal with you know two economic downturns. Um, you know, infighting between legislators at the Capitol, you know, multiple special sessions, a teacher walkout. She becomes the face for that and, and she really, you know, took her licks. Policy aside, I, I'm not weighing in on the budget itself. Her veto of the budget that's sent into a second special session did grab my attention. I, I thought that really showed her strength. I'm not saying it was a good idea or a bad idea because that depends on how you feel about the uh -huh. the bill itself. But I, I thought that at least showed that she was clearly going to take control. She took her power as governor, the strongest power she has, arguably the veto power, and she exercised it. And she said, "This is not enough. You got to go back and do better." Uh -huh. And th that did impress me actually. I, I'll say that. And um, I, I saw it showed her power, it showed her strength, and it showed her willingness to um, to stand up. And I, I don't think she always did a great job of showing that. It may have been there for the whole time. I just, again, I, I don't think the communication was what it could have been. And she showed right then how strong she could be. Yeah, you know, in that clip we showed, I mean, her big selling point to her legacy was, I think I'm leaving the state better than I found it. Um, you know, now some people may say, well, hey, some of these challenges were by your own doing. I mean, there were tax cuts that put you know, the state in, in a deeper hole. Um, but is Oklahoma better off, and how would you judge that? I mean, I pose that question to both of you. I mean, just kind of, do you think the state is better off? I know you're just in a relatively, you know, new Oklahoman, um, so you maybe can't attest to what it was like when you, when, uh, you know, when she first came into office, but how should we judge whether or not the state is better off or not? The country is better off than it was in 2010. I mean, economically, there's just no denying it. And that is regardless of who's in power, it's just the way it, I mean, the, clearly the economy was in deep, deep turmoil in 2010 when she took office. It, it, it's better off now 
Uh, the economy in Oklahoma, for that reason, is much better off. Um, and, and the state has made some progress, certainly, on a number of fronts. Um, you would think, looking at her uh, approval rating or disapproval rating, that somehow the state has tanked or has done much worse than it was uh, in 2010. That's not the case. So there's always, to me, I just keep coming back to, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but that just, to me, it, there's just always this disconnect between where the state is and what she's accomplished and what her approval rating is, uh, which is abysmally low right now. Yeah, but there are a lot of social challenges that face the state. And Darla, you know this better than almost anybody. I mean, a lot of your reporting is on, you know, where Oklahoma, you know, ranks the lowest, whether we're talking about, you know, suicide or childhood trauma and, and all these kind of things. I mean, I, I feel like that message, you know, partly to shine a light on it, like you've done as a journalist, but I mean, I think Oklahomans are, are continuing to kind of recognize the fact that Oklahoma is at the bottom of so many lists. Yeah. And I you know, think it's a reason why you saw Governor-elect you know, Kevin Stitt on the campaign say, I want to make us a top 10 state. I think he's speaking directly to that frustration. But it seems like in so many circles, um, you know, a lot of communities across the state you know, are, are struggling and people are becoming more aware of that. Yes, I think there's more attention being brought to that and a lot of those issues are just interconnected and mm -hmm. so when we're at the bottom of the list for this it's often connected to to that and so um it's but i think there ha there has been more discussion and attention being brought to to those issues and the fact that we are are at the bottom of so many of these lists yeah. well, there's quite a bit to unpack when it comes to the legacy of governor mary fallon her eight years in office which will come to an end in january as governor-elect kevin stitt takes office. His inauguration is scheduled for January 14th. Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about infrastructure spending. Uh, U.S. Senator Jim Inhofe sending some money towards Oklahoma for some uh, big projects across the state. And also uh, look at uh, Congressman Russell, his uh, election defeat and, uh, you know, some of the money that he has left in his campaign war chest. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back as we continue this episode of Political State. All right, welcome back to Political State from the Oklahoman. I'm Ben Felder in the second segment. Sticking with me is Justin Wingeter. And Justin, um, Senator Inhofe, one of his favorite things to do, and probably the favorite thing of a lot of senators, is to funnel money to his state this week, uh, or yesterday actually, an announcement of some money, um, some transportation spending that's coming towards Oklahoma, particularly uh, a grant to help fund a bus rapid transit line here in Oklahoma City to go up class and Northwest Expressway. Quite a, bi a big project that City Hall celebrated, something they've been working on for almost a, a decade. But this is kind of an Inhofe wheelhouse, right? I mean, loves to kind of funnel that money infrastructure is a big thing uh, for him yeah he's very much an old school politician in that way he sees it as priority number one to get as much money into the state as possible uh, this is very much a traditional uh, member of Congress sort of way of acting he enough hates the fact that there's there are no longer earmarks uh, major reform pushed through by Republicans uh, a few years under John Boehner in the house and that was a, a way to get away from some of the inherent corruption that occurs when you have uh, mm -hmm. an earmark program but nonetheless he he loved that system of not the corruption but of <laughs> of getting money into the areas of your state where uh into your district if you're in the house or into the whole state if you're a senator that is very much uh a gem and off sort of uh passion yeah and for some of our viewers who may not be you know they're familiar with the term earmarks but maybe aren't sure about that history i mean give us kind of a recap of, of, of what it used to be like and where we are now related to your yeah marks. essentially amendments within major spending bills just your little program that you need in case in the case of infrastructure i mean uh the the house committee that used to run infrastructure house transportation used to be massively and still runs infrastructure but used to be massively influential i mean if you had a pro or a little project you needed to get done you wanted that uh the chairman of that transportation committee to insert it into these bills they're massive bills they get approved all at once so you don't have a lot of scrutiny of individual projects at least not initially and uh yeah, that's the way it was done in Washington for a long, long time. That went away in the early 20-teens, if I recall correctly, as uh, you had the earmark reform. Again, led by Republicans, but Inhofe will tell you to this day that he's, he's very frustrated by the end of, of earmarks or 
sometimes called pork barrel spending. Yeah, and transportation, I mean, that's one of the things that states and cities are really dependent on the federal government. There are lots of area, other areas that they are as well. Um, but these transportation funds fun funneling down to, um, to the state. I mentioned this bus rapid transit line. Um, our, uh, our colleague Bill Crum will have a story this weekend on it. Um, this is a pretty big project for City Hall. And, uh, you know, I was talking to a, a city official who said, uh, um, you know, there's a little bit of irony uh, with uh, Inhofe being the one uh, directing these funds. Inhofe is a pretty big critic of climate change. Um, a lot of people say that, hey, public transit is one of the solutions to, or mass transit is one of the solutions to uh, uh, burning of fossil fuels. But they said, hey, this is why you don't criticize people in public. You still try to wield those relationships, even though you may disagree politically. There's still some common ground. He wants to spend more money invested in a state, and we want that money for transportation projects. It's a win-win. Yeah, and these are... Usually if it involves federal dollars, it's a massive project. It's just something that certainly cities cannot fund, and oftentimes states really just do not have that kind of money laying around. It, that's where you call in the feds, and that's where you get this grant money, and then you can do some pretty impressive things with, uh, with uh, federal grant money. Yeah, and that's something that Governor Luck uh, Stitt has talked quite a bit about, wanting to have that relationship, that good relationship with the federal government. You know, not just because you want to be friendly with your federal delegation, but, uh, you know, wants to really have it streamline some of the flow of those funds, those grants uh, to cities and counties and, and the state. I mean, his chief of staff, Michael Junk, is someone who worked for Inhofe, who yeah. was the deputy mayor uh, of Tulsa, so has those kind of connections at both the municipal and the federal level. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it just... It, it, this is where seniority pays off too. Mm -hmm. uh, of someone like Inhofe who's been there a long time. It's not to say there are you know not criticisms of seniority. There are of course those are legitimate. But there are benefits to having a senior members of Congress in your delegation. They know the way the game is played. They know how to who to talk to, how to get projects approved, and it does pay off sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, real quick before we wrap up this week's episode, I, I want to uh, check in with Congressman Russell, who's leaving office, lost to Kendra Horn. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about that, but you have a story coming up this weekend that looks at um, you know, campaign spending and maybe some money left on the table for the congressman who, who ultimately came up short. Yeah, we got FEC reports, campaign finance reports today, uh, last night, this morning. Uh, these are the post-general, so these, are, these go through the last couple weeks before the election and then some time after that. But we're really looking at those last couple weeks, right before the election, late October, first week in November. What were the campaigns doing? And obviously, Congressman Russell has faced a lot of criticism for his uh, lackadaisical approach to campaigning, I think, in October. Uh, and he left almost $300,000 on the table at, uh, on election day. So. This is uh, $300,000, about $295,000 that his campaign had, still has actually, um, and didn't spend. I talked to his campaign manager, he said, you know, uh, Russell made this pledge to not go negative, to not run negative ads, and TV ads are your probably biggest mm -hmm. expenditure if you're gonna spend right down the stretch, and, wanna, and you have a bunch of cash, it's probably what you're gonna spend it on. So they keep coming back to, you know, we just made this pledge not to go negative, Russell wanted to stick with it. That's why we have this unused cash. Any political observer looks at a, a race where you lost by 3,300 votes or so, and you left, not to come back to the number three, you had, you had $300,000 to spend. I mean, that, it's a very close race, and Russell had money that he was not spending as the race was getting very close at the end. Any political observer is gonna look at that and say, what, what was he doing? Yeah, I mean, you have to be calculated too, because you know, if you're if you if you're thinking, hey, if I win, I want to seek re-election again. You know, that money carries forward. Um, but you know, if you lose, you lose, and it's not you know, it doesn't do you any good. Um, maybe unless you run again or you try to seek the office again. I mean, so what can candidates do with the money that's left in their in their account? They have great freedom. There's a great investigation earlier this year into so-called zombie accounts, and these um, campaign accounts could do quite a few things. Obviously he could run again. It's very, you just file a statement of candidacy and then you can use all that money to run again and uh, $300,000 will get you a good start. He's, he's probably won elections on $300,000 yeah. before. He's not a big spender, never has been. But nonetheless, it would be a good start if you wanted to run it, if he wanted to run in 20. Um, you can donate it. Uh, you can donate to, you know, anybody. I mean, really, any other political organization, yeah. uh, national Republican groups, other campaigns, other candidates. Um, and he can also do some own uh, spending. He can keep a staff 
for example. You could spend it on polling. You could spend it on uh, your, your typical campaign thing. That's what it's there for, really. So uh, he, has, he has great freedom, and that is an account I think we'll keep an eye on, see what yeah. he's spending. If Obviously, if you're spending money on polling, you're keeping a staff that those are indicators, of course, that you're running in 20. Um, if not, then it could be an indication he's not, but I don't know. We'll, we'll just have to see. Yeah, well, you've got a story on that this weekend and, and Sundays, is that right? Uh, tomorrow, uh, Saturday. Saturday. So yeah. Saturday's issue of The Oklahoman. Uh, we talked a lot about Governor Mary Fallon, and our colleague uh, Dale Dinwalt has a story in Sunday's Oklahoma, kind of taking a closer look at her time in office. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Political State. You can find each and every episode on the Oklahoma's website, newsok.com, YouTube, or your favorite podcasting app. Thanks for joining us this week with Justin. I'm Ben, and we'll see you for another episode next Friday.